want to start by thanking Yovana and everyone at the Kin Center for Digital Innovation and the Rotterdam School of Management for including me in this incredibly interesting event. As we contemplate how work will be reshaped in the future and what role each of us will play in that reshaping, it's so important that we have spaces like this one for different stakeholders to come together. So I am excited to speak with you this morning and then to engage with all of you throughout the day. I think we all have something to contribute to defining, defining the future of work, but I also think we usually spend too much time talking only with people who share our own perspectives. So we can all get excited about technology that's innovative and powerful and cool, <laughs> but I'm grateful for, this, for groups like this one that want to look behind the tech at the workers whose lives are impacted by it. So with that said, I want to offer a provocation and then fill in a little bit, but then get to a conversation with all of you. So my provocation is that for far too many workers, the future of the work experience is too precarious. Even in the United States, where we have a very tight labor market, at least for now, income inequality is rising, many workers face uncertain schedules, inadequate wages, and unsafe workplaces. And the experience of the pandemic has had lingering psychological and economic impacts on many workers and on how employers manage those workers. And here's the really provocative part of the provocation, the platforms and AI in the workplace is exacerbating this precarity. So what do we do with precarity? For a precarious building, so metaphor I'm going to just keep using, so get used to it, uh, we would erect scaffolding to ensure that the building doesn't topple over. As a society, we can think of labor and employment laws as the legal scaffolding for, for work. These laws should set minimum standards to ensure that workers can earn at least a family-sustaining wage for a decent living, though they can be safe, care for their families, and be free from discrimination on the basis of sex, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Only when this scaffolding is in place can we then diagnose the source of the precarity, such as why in the 2020s, even in the most wealthy countries in the world, do we still have a number of companies that would pay poverty wages, cut corners on safety, and treat workers as disposable if left to their own devices? And how do we move more workers out of precarity and into thriving middle-class jobs? I would posit that the key to this question is found in the weakening of workers' collective power because there's no other entity other than the labor movement in the economy that can countervail corporate power other than the government. So it's one or the other, strong unions or strong mandates. And right now, at least in the US and in much of the world, with the power of the labor movement diminishing, we have to look more towards government intervention. So let's get back to assessing our legal scaffolding. My primary hypothesis is that the legal scaffolding in many or even most of our countries, and certainly in the United States, is failing to adequately do its job of stabilizing workers' precarity. Because, in part, it is out of date in the face of the increase in platform work and AI-driven algorithmic management. Workers are feeling the building sway in new ways. So we need to figure out where that scaffolding is weakest and build new supports. And this challenge is urgent. There's a concept in American property law, and I would imagine it exists in other legal systems too, called the attractive nuisance. It says that you can't let an unsafe condition exist on your property, and especially if that condition is likely to draw attention from those outside your property, and then assume that you'll be free from liability if somebody wanders onto your property and gets hurt, even if it's your property. So for example, you have to assume that kids will be attracted to exploring a creaky old house and that they will get injured while exploring it. Well, a legal system that seems to have loopholes and gaps and protections for workers in certain industries or under certain conditions is also an attractive nuisance. 
These gaps and oversights create incentives for employers to exploit them at the expense of workers. So let's start to ferret out the weaknesses in the scaffolding, and then I hope we can together start the work of reinforcing it with new policies and protections that work both for employees and employers. So I want to first discuss the weaknesses in the scaffolding of protection for workers who do platform work. The most obvious weakness is the problem of classification, that is, in determining who is an employee and who's an independent contractor. This classification issue is so important because almost every other part of the scaffolding is built upon that how that classification question is resolved. In the United States, if you're an employee, you're covered by minimum wage and overtime laws, you get workers' compensation. If you get hurt on the job, you get unemployment benefits if you lose your job. But if you're an independent contractor, you get none of those protections. And I'm sure most of you are well aware of how the classification problem has become a central battlefield in the fights between platform companies and worker advocates. In the US, platform companies are spending tremendous amounts of money on lobbying at the state, increasingly at the state level, but also at the federal level, to ensure that people who make money on their platforms are treated as independent contractors for the purposes of worker protection laws. Uh, just this week, the Biden administration weighed in with a proposal to undo the confusion created by the Trump administration, and many people are reading what the Biden administration has done as a predicate for expanding the definition of who's an employee and uh, diminishing the definition of who's an independent contractor. But I don't think I need to spend a lot of time making the case that this classification issue is a big one. But even if worker advocates could wave a magic wand and ensure that all workers earning income on platforms are employees, there would still be big questions about how the law would treat them, creating continued precarity even once we resolve, if we're able to resolve that big question. For example, the way that workers doing platform work, particularly rideshare and delivery drivers, toggle between platforms creates the question about who is their employer at any particular time. So if an Uber or Lyft driver has both apps open at the same time, even if we are sure that she is an employee, who is liable for, to pay for her time? If we say that it's, it's possible to be working for two employers at the same time, how should we allocate liability for workers' times between those two employers? I don't think this is an insolvable problem, but until we put new and specific definitions into place, we risk allowing both employers to evade responsibility. There's also the problem of how drivers' work time is calculated. Is time spent waiting to hear the chime that tells a driver a ride has been added to his queue compensable time? In the US, traditionally workers' time is compensable while they're waiting to work if their employer has asked them to be on call and they aren't able to freely use that waiting time for their own purposes. So how should we apply that def definition to rideshare drivers? The apps depend upon drivers being willing to drive around waiting for the ch chime and drivers face consequences if the chime comes and they don't and they too often don't respond. So does that mean that they're engaged to wait for the employer's benefit? If drivers are not paid for wait time, the companies have no incentive to limit the number of drivers on the road, which results in more drivers waiting longer to get assigned a ride and thereby earning even lower wages. So in New York City, they have an innovative answer to this problem by setting a minimum wage for drivers that includes paying drivers for wait time based on each company's data regarding the amount of time drivers on their apps are utilized, that is, actually having riders in their vehicles. So that's one answer. Then there is the problem of overtime protections for platform workers. Rideshare companies often assert that overtime protections would be anathema to their business model, which is built upon allowing drivers to work as many hours as, as they want. They seem to believe this assertion justifies paying all of those hours without a premium. But I'm not sure that logic is ironclad. The companies could allow drivers to work whatever hours they want and pay them a premium for hours over 40 the way other employers do. The desire not to seems based on economics and not on a legal impossibility. 
or they could tell drivers that they can't work excessive hours. So these issues of paying for wait time and paying overtime converge to make a new problem, which I think is hard to solve. If workers are paid for wait time and paid extra for a lot of wait time, it would create an incentive for drivers to stay on the road for long periods, even when there isn't demand for their services. So some kind of innovative solution is needed, but the principle of overtime pay is too important to just jettison. But clearly we need some accommodation of the principle uh, to allow drivers the flexibility that they claim to want. So the last area where I want to highlight how ill-suited at least the American law is to the challenge of protecting platform workers is in the area of collective bargaining rights. Even if platform workers were found by our federal labor agency, the National Labor Relations Board, to be employees, which with a Biden-controlled NLRB is a possibility, it's hard to see how unions could successfully organize these workers under at least the U.S. law as it now stands. Our collective bargaining rights are founded on the principles of exclusive representation, which is conferred when a union is able to get the support in a representation election of at least 50% plus one of the appropriate group of employees. So how would that group of employees be defined? Under US labor law, only people who are employed by a company can be included. But how do you know who is still employed by a platform company when so many workers have an intermittent or temporary relationship to the platform? In Seattle, Washington, they passed a rideshare collective bargaining law, which unfortunately never went into effect because of a series of legal challenges. But that law set a minimum number of hours as the criteria without concern about whether drivers who met that, that hours threshold had a present or continuing relationship with the platform. And there's a new Washington state law that builds in recognition of orga organizations representing drivers based on a numerical threshold, not majority status. So these are plausible approaches, but not ones available under US federal labor law at this time. I'm also anxiously watching in, uh, to see how the agreement between the GMB and Uber in the UK plays out. As I'm sure you know, the initial agreement between the union and the company includes different aspects of representation like access for the union to drivers, uh, representation during deactivation hearings, and periodic meetings with management. So these are just a few of the gaps in the legal scaffolding for workers who earn a living from platforms, all of which exist regardless of how the classification question is resolved. So now I want to move on to assessing the scaffolding of worker protections with regard to algorithmic management, the other big topic for this conference. Uh, in this topic, there are three areas where I think our traditional labor and employment laws are particularly outdated, especially in the U.S. And you might notice I keep saying especially in the U.S. This is an area where I think the U.S. is often far behind, certainly what's happening here in Europe. In protecting the privacy of workers from surveillance, in accurately accounting for workers' time when productivity measures are used, and in guarding against systemic bias in the hiring process. So let's start with privacy and the intrusion of surveillance into workers' lives in a more significant way as a result of AI-driven or algorithmic management. As a background fact, you should know that in the US, workers traditionally have a very tenuous right to privacy in the, work, in the workplace. To use our scaffolding metaphor, even under traditional employment conditions, the scaffolding is weak in the area of employee privacy. So then why is this an important area to discuss if at least for uh, workers in the US it seems like they don't have much to lose? But I think it's important because technological advances have given employers much more intrusive tools to invade workers' privacy, and they provide new incentives for engaging in this kind of intrusive behavior. So under common law in the US, workers can sue their employers for a breach of privacy only if the employer's conduct can be described as extreme or outrageous. So think spying on workers while undressing in the restroom, or going through workers' personal effects like purses or lockers without good cause. 
But because these causes of actions are so unusual, the doctrine defining what is outrageous, what is extreme, or what is justified is very vague. But with algorithmic management software, the potential for invasion has drastically increased. There are companies that require workers to wear devices that collect biometric data throughout the day. Is that extreme or outrageous? What if the company says it's collecting the data to protect workers' safety, which is certainly plausible? So should there be a requirement for employers to collect as little data as possible to achieve an ostensibly valid purpose? There's also been an increase in surveillance to detect theft or misconduct by, employer, by employees. I've even read about an employer that has embedded a recording device in employees' identification badges, which they are required to wear at all times while at work. This kind of surveillance isn't new. Employers have always searched bags on the way out of the factory or store or eavesdropped on workers' conversations. But software uh, allows the means by which such surveillance is carried out to be much more comprehensive. Is it ex extreme or outrageous for a worker to have her every move tracked or his every conversation with a coworker recorded? What if the tracking results in patterns that reveal personal relationships? Is that a violation of workers' privacy then? So requiring workers to give consent could be a way out of this dilemma of, of determining what is appropriate surveillance. But in the US, there's no right to consent before data is collected except in just a few states that require consent for conversations to be recorded. And even fewer states require consent for other kinds of electronic surveillance in the workplace or anywhere else. There is, however, a federal law that protects collection and use of medical information, so at least there's that. But in any event, few workers actually have the power on their own to deny consent, especially if their employment is conditioned upon giving it. So this is an area, again, where Europe is far ahead of the US. Under the EU's general data protection regulation, employers have to go through several steps in order to justify collecting personal data about workers. Uh, first, an employer must perform a privacy impact assessment, balancing an asserted legitimate interest in the data against the employee's privacy interests, and be prepared to prove that the purported legitimate interest outweighs the employee's privacy, right to privacy. Then the employer must provide notice to the employee that spells out exactly what data is, being, is going to be collected and what the employer is going to do with it. Another backstop to protect workers in Europe is that many European countries have high rates of union representation and works councils. So collective bargaining agreements and works councils provide two fora in which these competing interests can be discussed and negotiated. There are unions in the US, <laughs> and some of them are negotiating protections for their members in this area. For example, interestingly, the unions that represent professional American athletes have negotiated notice provisions in their contracts when team owners collect and utilize biometric data, which is very pervasive in that sector, but of course workers who have tremendous bargaining power. And the Communication Workers of America have negotiated right to know provisions that require employers to notify the union when workers' calls or computer usage is being monitored. But in the US, 94% of private sector workers don't have a union. And despite what you've read about a lot of organizing at Amazon and at Starbucks, I don't think anybody expects that that number is really going to change much in the near future. And in those non-union workplaces, employers have no obligation to get input from workers before imposing surveillance. So in a US workplace, electronic surveillance technically should not be used to try to prevent workers from unionizing. But I fear that having such a system in place would have a significant chilling effect on workers discussing an organizing campaign in that workplace. For example, imagine how many workers would be willing to stand nearby and chat with a coworker who was a known union supporter if they knew that the employer had access to data showing where every employee was at any time during the day. Or here's a really Orwellian scenario. 
What if the employer who collects biometric data could use it to monitor workers' physiological responses to different messages about a union campaign? Would that be lawful? Maybe not, but it would be hard for an employee to prove, especially if she didn't even know that the data were being collected. Electronic productivity monitoring exposes another area where our worker protection laws may be falling short. The location and biometric data I was just discussing is used in factories and warehouses to track productivity and efficiency, not just as a hedge against misconduct. The pandemic has greatly increased employers' reliance on these tools, especially with regard to employees working from home, as more and more are. Jody Cantor, a reporter for the New York Times, recently wrote an astonishing article about the breadth of employers who are using electronic productivity tools. And these tools include things like keystroke monitoring, analysis of email content, and even video surveillance through laptop and other computer cameras. One use of this data that Cantor's art story highlighted is calculation of time off task. Employers may use machine learning to review emails to see how often a worker is sending personal emails during the day. A warehouse employee may have her trips to the bathroom counted through location monitoring. One employee in the New York Times article used a one employer in the New York Times article used a laptop camera to take periodic pictures of the employee using the laptop to see if she was looking at the screen, which was recorded as being on task while looking away was flagged as being off task. So how does using this technology become an employment law problem? Shouldn't employers be able to track how productive their workers are and even to weed out the least productive among them? Productivity tracking, again, is nothing new. As I'm sure many of you know, in the late 1800s, Frederick Taylor popularized the management practice of scientifically managing workflows to maximize industrial efficiency. The image of Taylorism, as it was called, is a supervisor with a stopwatch standing over the shoulder of employees recording their work. But one new facet of this electronic Taylorism is, to, is its use to deny workers pay. Some employers are using this electronic evidence of time off task as a justification for docking workers pay. But such a re practice relies on a pretty simple definition of what a task is. Is an employee off task if they look away from the computer screen to make a note on a piece of paper? Is it off task for the warehouse worker to stop and help a coworker? And how many times in a shift is it appropriate to go to the bathroom? Um, in a world of in-person supervision, humans negotiate these definitions without even realizing it. And I'm not suggesting that a human-based system is infallible, of course not. Humans are universally fallible. But there is the intercession of judgment. The machine learning-based judgments run the risk of flipping the default of when a worker deserves to get paid for their labor. Generally, in a human-based recording system, workers get paid for the big blocks of time in which they are engaged, with deductions possibly for recognizable breaks to get lunch, if they exit the building, or if they log off a computer. And because of their size, those blocks are pretty clear and definable. With algorithmic monitoring, however, the danger becomes that these blocks of compensable time become more and more finely defined, with workers having to prove that they are entitled to pay during time that the algorithm deems they are off task, or that pay for that time disappears without their even knowing it because the system for tracking time becomes more and more opaque. It's very hard for an employee to hold an employer accountable for proper pay if they can't even decipher the system that made the calculation. So this is another area where the EU is ahead of the law in the US, or at least seems to be heading in that direction. The EU's proposed platform work directive requires at least some human intervention in employment decisions, at least for employees engaged in platform work. So the hiring process is the last area of algorithmic management that I want to cover. Here, I think the biggest problem may be the perception that algorithms have solved our problems. Instead, their use in making hiring decisions 
may be in part perpetuating old problems and creating new ones. How do algorithms create the perception that they are solving the problem of discrimination in hiring? By relying on the premise that people are biased, but algorithms are neutral. The first part of that sentence is undoubtedly true. There are people who hold prejudices, both explicit and implicit, and that's why we have to have laws to protect workers against discrimination. But the second part of that sentence is not necessarily true. Algorithms are not necessarily unbiased just because they aren't human. And that's for the simple reason that they are programmed by humans. Those programs can be plagued by the same explicit or implicit bias as people. For example, an algorithm can be programmed to screen out resumes of people who graduated from school before a certain year. That would be an obvious example of, dis of age discrimination. But rarely is the discrimination that easy to discern. Let's say that a company decides to advertise a, book on, a job on Facebook and micro-targets its ads to workers of a certain age. The company hasn't refused to hire anyone because of their age, so is that discrimination? Well, some seem to think that the answer to that question is yes. Facebook has, since that actual situation came up, has changed its practices to prohibit any race, gender, or age micro-targeting tar for job ads. But let's make it a little bit harder. Let's say a company uses an algorithm to analyze the characteristics of its highest performing employees, find the pattern of characteristics among those employees, and apply that pattern to the resumes for a job vacancy. In one infamous example, a company used this kind of screen. There were no humans involved. It was specifically programmed not to, uh, to make any assessment of race, age, or gender. Um, and the resume screening tool learned that applicants named Jared or who played lacrosse in high school were most likely to be successful. And those are two characteristics that, at least in the U.S., correlate very, very closely to being a young white man. So in this example, the algorithm is reinforcing bias that already existed in that workforce. And that certainly seems like discriminatory conduct. Another way that bias can creep into the hiring process when controlled by an algorithm instead of a human is the increasing reliance on tools that may screen out people with disability. There are uh, increasingly interviews happen online, and there are programs that then assess facial expressions. There are people with, neuro, with non-neurotypical facial expressions who can get screened out that way. There's the gamification of the hiring process um, where people are asked to play computer games as part of the hiring process. Obviously, there are people with disabilities who may not perform well on those kinds of tests. So those are just a couple of the ways that we should be uh, particularly concerned about not falling prey to this premise that if you seem to take the human out of hiring, that you've taken the bias out of hiring. It's also very, very hard to pinpoint that bias. Algorithms can be making thousands, hundreds, thousands of decisions. And so how can uh, an unsuccessful applicant actually pinpoint where that bias came in? So, so far, I've raised a lot more questions than I have provided answers. I find this is the fun part of being an academic as opposed to an actual policymaker. <laughs> if I had all the answers, this would be a very short conference. We'd just do the fun networking stuff. Um, but I'd like to recommend a next step as we work through these issues together here in Amsterdam and when we all go home and continue our individual work. I think that a critical next step is to agree on a set of principles to govern how we reinforce the legal scaffolding for reshaping work. If we can agree on principles, the work of coming up with legislation or contract provisions or new policies will be a lot easier. Not easy, but easier. So I'll get the ball rolling and offer a few that I think are important. First, Workers themselves must be centered in answering these questions, especially workers of color and those who are low income or are most likely to feel the precarity of work at this point in time. In the U.S., this is especially challenging because of the low rates of unionization and the impediments in the law to employers actually engaging with employees in non-union settings. So for us, then, this may mean giving the government a bigger role in getting input from workers um, and their representatives. For me, ideally, that means that it would 
that we would reform our labor laws so it was easier for workers to have unions. Two, any recommendations have to have as a touchstone whether they at the very least advance family sustaining wages, the right to a safe and healthful workforce, and an adequate safety net for times of lack of work or injury. Third, transparency must be expanded and made meaningful. It's not enough to say that workers, especially those who are not represented by a union, can have access to the algorithms that govern their work lives. Somehow we have to figure out a way that those algorithms can be understood by those whose lives they impact and those responsible for holding companies that use those algorithms accountable. Maybe that's by imposing greater validation requirements on the use of such software or having available public resources for making assessments of their fairness. And then fourth, anti-discrimination laws must be fully applicable and enforceable. We can't rely on the misapprehension that algorithms or platforms are neutral. We have to be scrupulous in monitoring for bias in construction and impact. So I want to end with an interesting caution from what I think is an unexpected source. So recently, Satya Nadella, the, as I'm sure you all know, the Microsoft CEO, um, urged caution in using a lot of the practices that we've just discussed here and that we'll be discussing throughout the day. Um, I think he, the, the phrase that's getting picked up by the media is productivity paranoia. But I take a bigger lesson from his warning. And I think the bigger lesson is that we have to bring humility and compassion to this project, that just because we can do something with this powerful technology doesn't mean that we should. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. To